Welcome back one and all as we close out another week here at the Damage Report. With me, John Adorola and the host of the happy half hour. The happiest half hour really, I checked, none exceed it, Red Ehrlich. How's it going? Many people have talked about their hours being happy, happy, but our hour is our finest hour and our hour of happiness is the happiest. So analyzing, I think that makes sense. Um, it is a very happy hour though. Uh, so anyway, glad to have you here. Um, are we going to be seeing you delve not into a happy hour, but a gaming hour? Is that no gonna game busters? No, no game, game busters, busters this week. I'm sorry. Jorben's out of town. And also, get it's Good Friday, idiots. You should okay. be celebrating. Checks uh, notes. The death of your savior. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you celebrate it? Um also You're the ones who call it good. We maintain a strict separation of church and TDR. So everybody celebrate or don't celebrate. It's all good, baby. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm more uncomfortable than I generally am at the beginning of shows, but uh, we have a big old show. Um, not only are we gonna be diving almost immediately into what in the authoritarian hell is going on in Tennessee, which we will. But Clarence Thomas finally responds to ProPublica's amazing investigation of his, I'm gonna say historic level of corruption that he's engaged in, at least in reference to the Supreme Court. Uh, we've got Joe Biden going back on another campaign promise while trying to hide it as a good thing. But we'll we'll dive into that and we'll see what we can figure out. And uh, we were a little bit worried about death threats potentially coming to the judge in Donald Trump's hush money uh, case. And uh, yeah, it didn't take long. So we're gonna be analyzing that a little bit too. And then in the aftermath, not only are we gonna be taking stock of uh, Elon Musk threatened all of the, the blue checks that they were gonna lose it unless they signed up for his uh, you give the richest man in the world eight bucks a month thing. And uh, we're gonna be evaluating how successful that threat was, uh, that little ultimatum. And we've got fake fury, but then garbage people of the week. And I particularly like my garbage people, <laughs> uh, garbage person I should say this week. Um, with all that said, if you uh, would like to send us any comments, tweets, super chats, all that. Either to make a point, ask a question, get a laugh, maybe get a $100 Blue Apron gift card. You can do that and Brett and I will respond as we go. We're also gonna be doing an impromptu art show in our first social break because we had an amazing fan who did some just incredible posters of different members of the extended TYT family. So we're gonna be showing those off. But with all that said, Brett, are you ready to do this thing? Let's get into it, everybody. Let's get nasty. Yeah, normally when I ask that, it's like a formality. It's just sort of one of our rituals or whatever. But in this case, it is just the worst sort of news. It's a big old story, so I did want to make sure. But since you've given your consent, let's jump into this. To expel voices of opposition and dissent um, is a signal of authoritarianism, and it is very dangerous. And I hope that as a nation watches that that we that we we put this this light on Tennessee to say that. This should sound the alarm across the nation that we're entering into very dangerous territory. That is Tennessee uh, State Senator Justin Jones, or I guess I should say now former state re uh, state legislator, since the Tennessee House did successfully vote to expel Justin Jones, uh, Justin Pearson, as well for the crime of having participated in a protest. I mean, that's the cover story. At least I think everyone in America knows exactly why they did what they did, whether they oppose or support the move. What the Republicans did is what they're doing all over the country in a thousand different forms. They have realized that they cannot win elections, they cannot gain nor hold power legitimately. And so they're using whatever means they have to contradict the will of the people, to make elections irrelevant since they've become unwinnable. Though uh, that gentleman that you just saw, and you're going to see Justin Pearson as well, uh, won elections. The Republicans do not think that they can beat them, so they just removed them. And we're gonna be jumping into that. There was also, by the way, of course, Representative Gloria Johnson. They tried to kick her out as well. They failed by one vote in that case, and we will be jumping into that as well. I guess minimal credit to the seven Republicans who did not participate in this authoritarian uh, power grab in Tennessee. But to give you an idea, of how insane it is that they did these expulsions. Uh, take a look at former representative uh, Justin Pearson explaining what normal, what, what doesn't normally get you expelled. 
If you look at what it takes to expel a member, what it should take, most of the times that a member in the Tennessee state legislature have gotten expelled in the last two times in particular, one, the guy committed sexual assault against 22 people. The other committed bribery. We broke a house rule because we're fighting for kids who are dying from gun violence and people in our communities who want to see an end to the proliferation of weaponry in our communities. And that leads to our expulsion. This is not democracy. It is no coincidence that the two youngest black lawmakers in the state of Tennessee and one or two women are on trial today. That is not accidental. This is what happens when you lose democracy. I think he's 100% right. Uh, I think everyone understands exactly why uh, it, him and Justin Jones were knocked out. We're gonna get into more of that. But also uh, for historic context, before this week, the most recent expulsion was in 1866, when six House members were expelled for trying to stop Tennessee from ratifying the 14th Amendment, which established citizenship for people who had been enslaved. So interesting that like 150 years can go by, but still racism is at the core of all of this. Brett, what do you think? So I, it's kind of his fault for fighting uh, for children mm -hmm. is what it sounds like. That sounds like the logic is that he was too upset that children were killed. Now you look at the Republican Party's makeup and usually they get, they get mad about that in name only. They're mad when pre-children, like as soon as you fertilize an egg, if you do anything to that, you're the devil. But once those kids, according to Republican logic, if I'm following it correctly, once those kids are out there, they're kind of similar to the, the animals in Big Game Hunter, which is a really fun game to play when you're no longer drinking Bud Light at bars. You, you shoot at the animals and it's very fun. That the Republicans, it seems by how they're behaving, that's what children are for. Unless they're like trying to go to a swim meet, in which case you need to inspect their genitals. It's very difficult for me yeah. to really follow the logic of the Republican party here. But that seems to be the roadmap for their overall party platform. And it seems to work. I mean, it works so well in Tennessee that even though Trump got 60% of the vote in 2020, the legislature is 78% Republicans. So that's it. So if you're looking for logic, the math is weird because they're probably using common core devil's logic and, and devil's math. And, and if you speak up about this in any way about how illogical the Republicans are being, they will. They won't listen to you because they are no longer the party of ideas. Well, they're the party of their ideas, but they will just eliminate you from the house for using not just not the microphone to speak, but a different microphone, a bullhorn, which is just a microphone with the speaker in it. Mm -hmm. The rules are very complicated, but you don't understand. I think that the takeaway is you guys just don't understand. Yeah, um, well, then I'll have to join them because uh, I don't understand how we've gotten to this place as a culture without more pushback against these moves. Not to say that there's not any, the, the people of Tennessee have been amazing. In the original protests that spurred this, their reaction throughout this week to what happened. Um, I would also like to welcome the national media to knowing about this story in the last possible moment. Not days before when if a national like uproar had been raised, Maybe there would have been a different result, but in any event, now they're talking about it, so that's good. For years, one of your colleagues who was an admitted child molester sat in this chamber, no expulsion. One member sits in this chamber who was found guilty of domestic violence, no expulsion. We had a member pee in another member's chair in this chamber, no expulsion. In fact, they're in leadership. What you're saying to us, since you're trying to put us on trial, I'll say what you're really putting on trial is the state of Tennessee. What you're really showing for the world is holding up a mirror to a state that is going back to some dark, dark roots. 
Yep, and look, there's obviously a lot of places in America that have some really, really dark roots that you don't have to go that far back to find. But um, Tennessee is definitely historically one of those places. This is completely unacceptable to a modern audience that likes democracy. But in the context of Tennessee, I mean, I feel like this fits in pretty well with some of how their politics has gone over the last couple of centuries. Um, I would add to it, and I understand it's Congress versus the state legislature, but like um, George Santos is still a congressman. He will be until he's eventually beaten in a primary. Uh, when Marjorie Greene was outed as like liking posts about a bullet in Nancy Pelosi's head and all of that, they were censured, still serving. They're still in Congress. They spoke through a bullhorn, and so they have to be out. I don't know. I, I look. I am hoping that there will be a big reaction at the end of this block. We're gonna be talking a little bit about where we go from here, but I mean, the the Republicans think that they nailed this thing, um, and and I hope that it's eventually proven that they were wrong. Um, can we go back to the guy who peed in someone else's chair? How is that? Yeah, I would like more details on that. Like that's interest. That's that's along the lines of bullhorn. Like if you're kicking people out for bullhorn in decorum, as they say, in the House of Rep or you know, in the in the Tennessee State Legislature, I think the P thing, I think that would be there. I think that would be in line. But if you're so so ideally what they would do is they say, well, they're trying to go behind this argument that it's all about procedure and decorum rules. This is not a partisan situation. This it doesn't have to do with the fact that you guys are advocating to keep children safe by passing common sense gun legislation that is itself wildly popular. Talk about triggered, they're triggered not by the murders of children, but by the idea that everyone's pointing out the obvious. Mm-hmm. The obvious, which is, yeah, we should probably make it harder for folks to get a gun and go kill kids like this, period. Yeah, I- and it's a great like, opportunity because it was a trans person who did it. You'd think the Republicans would be, you know, up in arms, so to speak, over that. Nope, still, still nothing because that gun lobby money is so damn sweet. Yeah, I. It's just weird to be in a position where the only takeaway I can come to, I guess, is if Justin Jones and Justin Pearson had walked onto the legislature floor with bullhorns. And had pulled down their pants and peed into the bullhorns, they'd still be representatives. But because they spoke through them, they are not. And the Republicans are the ones who venerate free speech. They don't like canceling people for what they say or do. Um, What a ridiculous fiction. Just to make a point, I don't want to blow anyone's mind here, but if we can go to graphic 10. this is a bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest. I think, we, yeah, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, this is the, and if we go on to more information about Forrest's notoriety, only increased when in 1867 he became the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, a secret hate organization that employed terror of pursuit in its white supremacist agenda. Why am I bringing up Nathan Bedford Forrest bust? Because those legislators would have had to walk past it. In the Nashville State Capitol on their way to go make a statement about gun violence in America. It's amazing. Until when? How long was this in the State House? The first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan? It was removed, according to this headline, in 2021. Bust of the Klan leader is removed from Tennessee. It's it was in the Nashville State Capitol House. Where they would walk by if every anyone is denying the legacy of racism in the mm-hmm. Tennessee Tennessee State Legislature, that legacy was literally on full display in a two and a half foot bust on a platform that was self two and a half feet, a five foot tall statue of the Grand Wizard of the KKK. So your idea of oh this is just a decorum ground rules violation here, no. 100% provable that only with our pressure that you should probably get rid of the grand wizard of the KKK. Finally, there's the 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 ocular proof of racism yeah. has been removed from the state house. 
Maybe they just want to make sure that everybody remembers that Tennessee is where the KKK began. Um, they don't want anyone to learn from that. They just maybe want to remind them of it. Maybe it's a point of pride, I don't know. It certainly acts like that's what they think. If the bust sticks around until I'm gonna say after the launch of the third season of Stranger Things, I kind of feel like you probably could have gotten rid of it a couple of years earlier. In any event, I wanna jump down or move on to another angle on this because of course the goal had been three representatives removed. They didn't get that. So um, here we're gonna jump into, hold on a second, I think we, yes. Uh, we're gonna jump into uh, Gloria Jones uh, being asked about that. Why were those two expelled and you weren't? Well, I think it's pretty clear I'm a six year old white woman. And they are two young black men. I, I, in listening to the questions and the way they were questioned and the way they were talked to, um, I was talked down to as a woman, mansplained to, but it was completely different from the questioning that they got. Context of Tennessee, I think a lot of people understand why the GOP might be more eager to take out the non 60 year old white women in the equation. Uh, but the state speaker, Cameron Sexton, he does not like this sort of narrative. So here is his explanation for why there was a different outcome for her. I mean, that's a false narrative on her part. She had two attorneys in the well. And if you go back and look at the opening, uh, her attorney, John Mark Wendell, um, came out strong, made a lot of points that she was not as active a participant as the other two. She didn't grab the bullhorn. She didn't scream and yell. Uh, she didn't uh, uh, leave the protest. Oh, she didn't talk through the bullhorn. Well, that is a big difference, I guess, to them. If you're if you're coming up with a cover story, I guess that's your out. Her voice was a little bit less loud, I suppose. Bear in mind, this is a guy who earlier this week says that two of the members, Representative Jones and Representative Johnson, have been very vocal about January 6th in Washington DC about what that was. What they did today was equivalent, at least equivalent, maybe worse, depending on how you look at it, to doing an insurrection in the state capitol. So it, he jumped right past this is an insurrection in the state capitol and said this is worse than an insurrection in the state capitol. Because some representatives, some activists, some young people were being loud and a little unruly about the fact that yet more kids were needlessly gunned down and nothing was clearly gonna be done about it. And I have heard a ton of attempts to both sides insurrection now, even Fox and Friends is like, well, this is just the only, the only thing we should take away from them losing their positions is don't storm capitals. And, and they're consistent because they were really hard on the January 6 people. I will remind you that in this case, no demonstrators broke into the Capitol, no one was arrested or injured, no property was damaged. But the legislative business was briefly halted as a result of the people talking through bullhorns. So it was exactly like January 6th, except for all of the things bad about January 6th. What do you think, right. Sticks and stones might make break your bones, but words might get you thrown out of the state legislature, says the party of free speech. Yeah, um, we've given you our reactions. Let's, what? what no, that's say? it, no, go for it, that's it. Uh, obviously, there have been a lot of strong reactions to the Tennessee legislature deciding that since they can't, they figured out that they can kick out Democrats for no reason whatsoever, they're just gonna start doing it. So uh, we have President Joe Biden saying today's expulsion of lawmakers who engaged in peaceful, peaceful protest is shocking, undemocratic and without precedent. Rather than debating the merits of the issue, these Republican lawmakers have chosen to punish, silence and expel duly elected representatives of the people of Tennessee. That is exactly what they did. I, maybe there's something more that you could do than just comment on it. I don't know, I would love to see something. Why doesn't Biden go to Tennessee? Why don't Democratic leaders go and camp out in Tennessee? It is after all the beginning of a presidential election. Maybe reminding people that the Republican Party long ago turned against democracy. Uh, also is viciously targeting people of color for political annihilation. Maybe those wouldn't be a bad thing uh, to remind people of. 
But Barack Obama also tweeted this nation was built on peaceful protests. No elected official should lose their job simply for raising their voice, especially when they're doing it on behalf of our children. I agree, NAOC said Republicans may think they won today in Tennessee, but their fascism is only further radicalizing and awakening an earthquake of young people, both in the South and across the nation. If you thought youth organizing was strong, just wait for what's coming, Gen Z don't play. Yeah, the, remember the, the entire thing started not entirely, but largely based off of young activists not willing to accept the status quo on needless daily massacres. Um, we know some more than 70% of young voters voted for a Democrat in the last election. What does the Republican Party think they're doing with all of these moves? They think that this is helping them long term. That not only did they, it's easy to point out, of course, that the two representatives that were eliminated were people of color. They were also incredibly young. It's amazing that they were in those positions to begin with. So you're telling young people that if they overcome all of the amazing hurdles to entering government, then old angry fascists will just kick them out. I don't know, maybe that's a win for the Republican Party long term. Doesn't seem like it to me. What do you think? Uh, I think it's absolutely fascinating. It's thoroughly fantastic um, that like, I mean, maybe you're just maybe maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe instead of a bullhorn, they brought a bull into the Capitol. Is all I could think of, like an actual bull with horns trying to trying to hurt people. Um, it is it's wildly disproportionate to the things that they were doing, and also all these comparisons to like January 6. It's yeah, as you point out, it's like a very weird contortion of selective memory to try to make comparisons. One is like they they it was it was. You know, not part of a, the procedure they were trying to stop was one of democracy, um, and it was based on utter falsehoods and lies. Meanwhile, like you can name the dead people that were slain. Like that those are real things that happened, yeah. and I think this should be amplified. Like what they did is they took a bullhorn to what they're actually doing. If no one spoke up about this, if the Tennessee state legislature was like, "All right, fine." They're supposed to play by the normal playbook. Don't they understand? Didn't they get it? As as someone who I'm still trying to get these Republican, I'm trying to act as a Republican consultant and <laughs> come to me for advice if you want any. Uh, but the playbook is you're supposed to say thoughts and prayers after a killing, and then you're supposed to just wait. And you're supposed to do nothing. You're not supposed to kick people out of the legislature because all that does, as AOC point out, is embolden more people. To point out how horrible you're being. Yeah. And it's this weird flex, this weird Republican flex that think they can get away with it. And it's actually incumbent upon us to go buy more bullhorns and, and spotlights and make this so that everybody knows what they're doing and how. Now, yeah. the, the the headwind that we face is that the gerrymandered districts have made it so that those those uh, levers of power are so entrenched in, in because the no matter how much you vote, it's very hard to change the makeup of the state legislature. That's why you need to get involved in organizations that actually try to put um, nonpartisan anti gerrymandered rules in place so that state legislatures don't look like Tennessee's does where they have a, a much larger proportion of representation in the House of Republicans than they do a proportion of the popular vote. Yeah, 100%. Um, looking forward really fast, we're gonna close on this. The Tennessee Democratic Party has already begun fundraising to support the two expelled members in special elections. And according to the Tennessee state constitution, they cannot be expelled a second time for the same reason. So that is that is going to be mildly inconvenient to the Republicans. They're gonna to have to come up with another absolutely transparent cover story for why they're taking out these representatives. If you would like to support these efforts, uh, Chris Murphy had tweeted out an Act Blue link where you can donate to the reelection efforts for the two uh, representatives, um, and obviously the two representatives as well. Justin Pearson had, tw had tweeted it out, so uh, that is available. I would love to see them get all of the money and more that they need to crush their opponents in the special election, and then when they get back in, to be like twice as emboldened, twice as aggressive um, in representing their their constituents. I think. Like we we can debate like the the wider political significance of all this, the effects of it. Um, but I think the the takeaway is that many people on the national stage have now been exposed to two uh, awesome young leaders who are amazing public speakers, uh, great at representing their passionate supporters. They're now, by the way, on social media a thousand times more significant than they were. Uh, the Republican Party has likely created two future national leaders. Um, but stay tuned to find out.
But that said, we're gonna take our first break. We come back, Clarence Thomas responds to the amazing uh, corruption journalism that was done this week by ProPublica. We'll give you the results after this. It seems like a real run up by the media to push for either more members of the court, uh, more court, court packing, or just changing the subject from the absolutely uh, desperate shape the US economy is in and the desperate numbers, desperately bad numbers for Joe Biden. This is total bull, okay? And I put this in the same category as Alvin Bragg's indictment against President Trump. As Laura Ingram's incredibly low energy attempt to distract people from the amazing work that ProPublica did in profiling literally decades of massive, some, some total millions of dollars of gifts and trips that Harlan Crow, real name, gave to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. It is bribery on a level that I hope we've never seen before. I hope never's happened before, um, but to her, she puts all of this on the same level as the Alvin Bragg thing. I don't doubt that she does. It's something that she doesn't want the audience to take seriously, but that they would definitely take seriously if it was someone other than Clarence Thomas or Donald Trump who were implicated in them. If this was as people as many have noted, if Sonia Sotomayor had been like taking a trip through the Caribbean on the George Soros Carnival or something, I think Laura Ingram would have an issue with it. I think I think that if Joe Biden had been uh, you know, paying hush money payments from his affair with a adult film star, I think maybe Laura Ingram would be interested in the legal process that resulted from that. But of course, when it's their own guys, they don't care. Brett, what do you make of it? I'd like to report a missing person and I think we should go check on him. He's a cute little baby boy, his name's Tucker Carlson. Where's <laughs> Tucker? <laughs> If you watch Tucker Carlson on a daily basis, this has all the trappings of something he would hate. Elites in Washington behind yeah. the scenes telling you that they're all oh, just for the people when really <laughs> they're literally on a yacht somewhere glad handing each other under the robe. Where's Tucker Carlson? I hope he's okay. Is he alive? Somebody check on him. Honestly, the, yeah. The amazing thing is that Laura Ingram mentioned it at all. I guess that's progress. I guess that's how you know it's a story that rises to a certain level that they don't just ignore it. Like the five, I think they made a verbal reference to it and then went on to the Little Mermaid. It's one of the most amazing stories of corruption on the Supreme Court. It's literally taking super yacht trips it's with one of the wealthiest people in the country. Yahtzee, <laughs> it's a yacht that births other yachts as it travels around the world. And the populist news network doesn't think it's a big issue. Decades of hidden gifts and trips. The okay, well look, I understand the only more, I uh, the only more ironic trafficking of sacred artifacts than giving Clarence Thomas the 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 Bible that once belonged to Frederick Douglass. Those those kinds of strange, horrible ironies are usually reserved for Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> when the, like the yeah. Nazis looking around for the Ark of the Covenant Covenant that the Jews used is Clarence Thomas and these utter right wing psychos saying like, here's a touching piece of equal rights history. <laughs> uh, also a bust of Abraham Lincoln, don't also forget that. Ab woke ass Abraham Lincoln. Exactly. I don't know, I just watched a Matt Bible. Walsh video that told me that slavery was fun. So I feel like all these wokies on the right or on the yeah. left are, are uh are trying to get this saying it belongs in a museum. It does belong in a museum. Uh, by the way, fun little note, Clarence Thomas ruled on a massive bribery case while accepting those vacations. Now, to be fair, back in 2016, it was a unanimous decision, which either means that maybe it wasn't a big deal or maybe all of them are accepting gifts like this. Uh, ProPublica, get on that, please. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, we also find out that that same GOP billionaire, Harlan Crow, again, how is that not a villain in like a 1950s murder mystery? Anyway, uh, didn't just fund Clarence Thomas's vacations and his wife's political pack. Uh, he also gave thousands of dollars to Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. What a small world when it comes to corruption. Oh, by the way, also Henry Cuellar, how fun. Um, also, we found out that ProPublica was not actually the first outlet to investigate these gifts. The LA Times did 20 years ago. And do you know what's interesting about that? It was immediately after that reporting two decades ago that Clarence Thomas stopped reporting the gifts. And I want you to bear that in mind as we turn to his response to this entire thing because Clarence Thomas has now responded to ProPublica's corruption research into him. A profile of these millions of dollars of gifts and trips he was given. And here's what he had to say. He said that Crow and his wife Kathy are Kathy Crow, man, that's something, are dearest friends who they've joined on family trips. Early in my tenure at the court, I sought guidance from my colleagues and others in the judiciary and was advised that this sort of personal hospitality from close personal friends who did not have business before the court, which he very much does constantly, by the way, was not reportable. I have endeavored to follow that counsel throughout my tenure and have always sought to comply with the disclosure guidelines. He has not been complying with them, by the way. So I don't, maybe he tried and failed, but he didn't do it. He noted that he would now comply with changes made to disclosure rules that were announced last month. Would he if the reporting had not come out? But anyway, his cover story is hey, uh, during my early years, I talked to other people and they said this is totally cool, which is an interesting story, not a true story. Because apparently he did disclose gifts and trips for, I'm gonna say 14 years or so. I don't know how you define early years, but it was only in the early 2000s when the LA Times profiled some of the gifts and trips he'd been given that he stopped complying with it. So that story was obvious BS. It's also verifiable BS because it doesn't actually match the historic record. Right? What do you think? You skipped my favorite quote, which is- What's uh, that? Which is the, the the crow himself saying, I just knew he was a fan of Frederick Douglass. And I saw that <laughs> item come available at an auction and I bought it for him. This is the same argument as if you said, I heard he liked money, so I gave him money. <laughs> That's, That's what a bribery is. You give them things they want to develop. Here's a thing of value. And how do I know it has value? It I know how much you bought it for and you gave it to him. And yeah. you are getting closer and closer to him. This is how the corruption works. It is the banality of evil. But yeah. these are <sighs> just people who hang out. And it, it just confirms everyone's worst fears. That there's this glad handing. And what they don't understand is that they should have a different worst fear, which is that that partisanship dictates the selective outrage. Yeah. It, can I? This would have been my garbage person, except it broke too late for me to have the graphic made. So, all that we know from the ProPublica thing about Clarence Thomas. I wish I could show this to you because this is a tweet from CNN Politics that I saw before we went live. Judge Juan Marchand, the judge overseeing Donald Trump's criminal case in New York, donated $35 in political contributions to Democrats in 2020, including a $15 contribution to the campaign of Trump's opponent, President Joe Biden. That's the whole tweet because you see both sides do it. Both sides are corrupt and biased. Millions of dollars in international trips and exclusive all mail. Uh, like getaways and historic artifacts of American government. He donated $15 to Joe Biden. If I was Joe Biden, I'd actually be mad because the dude is a judge. He definitely had more money than that. This is what CNN decided to inject into the conversation. Thank you, thank you. Really fast, I want us to respond to this. I have no real hope that anything will come of this, but hey, who knows? Let's go to this video. I think this is an emergency. Um, I think that this is a crisis. I think we've had a crisis for some time uh, on the Supreme Court. Congress is out of session for the next week. Um, so, and so that does give Democrats um, sometimes some time to strategize. 
And the way I feel about it is that the I do think articles need to be introduced. If we decide strategically that the actual author of those articles and, and who introduces them may not be me, that's fine. I will support impeachment. But I just think that if no one's going to introduce it, I, I would certainly be open to doing so and drafting them myself. I think this is uh, gone far, far beyond any sort of acceptable standard in in any democracy, let alone in American democracy. AOC, of course, had pushed for Clarence Thomas to be impeached if it turned out that what was in the ProPublica uh, reporting turned out to be true. Yesterday, she said that he should be impeached and she is uh, sticking with that. Uh, I haven't seen any Republicans acknowledge that this is literally even a minor scandal. Like obviously they're not going to support him being impeached. Although one one hundredth of this would be enough to clear literally every Democrat off of the court. Um, they're not even admitting that this is something that's untoward, frowned upon, any of that. According to them, they have no problem. So uh, I kind of doubt that this impeachment effort will be successful, but uh, good on AOC for pushing for it. Um, you can find the rest of that interview at Lever News. David Sirota uh, got a chance to talk with the representative. Uh, Brett, what do you think? There should be a part of the process before the story breaks where they report it without names. Oh, that'd be so good. Oh, why didn't they do that? You should just say, hey, what if I told you, oh. your little Morpheus glasses, what if I told you that a Supreme <laughs> Court justice accepted mega yacht trips from a big time donor? What would you? But that might be something something you might be interested in, <laughs> and just see what they do, just to get them on record, because because the every reaction to that question would be gold, because it would be some version of I've got to find out who it is. They'll say I need to find out more, and you can ask what more do you need to know? Because I'm I'm about to break the story. What more do you need to know? What aspects should I really nail down on when I when I premiere this? When I drop this story, and what would your what would your position be? And that would really expose the hypocrisy even more. It's just, I, I wish we could have it. I so wish that we could have it. That would be so good. We were just talking about Bill Pullman in the break and uh, Brett was not a fan of me continuing to grow my hair out. Brett's mom apparently not a fan of me continuing to grow my hair out. My and that was the final straw. Was people. it really? Was it really? No, I had been thinking was about like, it. He looks so much better now. My mom who doesn't I chime in on what that. is done at the network very often at all. Yeah. And most the, the, I'll ask and she'll be like, it was cute. I didn't see it. And then with John, she was like, what are we doing? <laughs> the thing that was actually the final straw was uh, last weekend when I was, when I, my wife and I, we walked to WrestleMania. It was like a mile and a half each way. And your hair just, yeah, you and so didn't the whole have time like I'm walking, the, I'm like, <laughs> you had like this way that was like, I don't yeah. know, like these ham hands when you were trying to get it out of your. I your just face. hate it. I hate it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, well, um, at least you can grow it, buddy. At least you can grow it. I know, I know. I died briefly. I had hair to my shoulders freshman year. Did I look like Jesus? Yes. Um, but that this was the the second longest my hair has ever been. Uh, second to. Uh, freshman year. I look okay, like with Jesus, that said, because I weighed 128 pounds. And I, one uh, time freshman year, I went, I know we're not in the break anymore, but one time freshman year, I was like showing, I realized yeah. I was like Jesus, and I took my shirt off and just showed people like this. And one room that I saw was like, they were like, look, I had just murdered them. And then I looked back at my RA, it was like, that's Bible study. Oh my God. They thought the rapture was upon us anyway. Okay, uh, we'll talk more about hair later on. Um, but anyway, uh, we have news to talk about. So, and it's serious news. So let's get serious and talk about this. The Biden administration has finally weighed in on one aspect of this state level, but still national debate about the transgender community having to do with uh, high school and college athletes. And what they have proposed is being pitched as sort of like tolerant guidance from the national government potentially. Um, it's not exactly how I see it when you dive into the text of it. So here's what they're gonna do. Under the proposed rules, elementary school students would generally be able to participate on school teams consistent with their gender identities. That's sort of the headline version of this. 
But it would also allow K through 12 schools and universities to limit the participation of transgender students when including them could undermine quote, fairness in competition or potentially lead to sports related injuries. It would be up to, in the end, schools to navigate how exactly the restrictions would be allow, uh, applied. The education department advised that schools would have to assess the age of students, the level of competition, as well as the nature of the sport itself. The impact may be different, for example, in track versus badminton. And the US Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona says, being on a sports team is an important part of the school experience for students of all ages. Every student should be able to have the full experience of attending school in America, including participating in athletics free from discrimination. And that is a great quote that the rules they just announced do not reflect. We are being told, and I see it in headlines, Biden says they should be allowed to compete, but then says, well, unless the school thinks it's unfair, which is the story that conservatives tell everywhere, regardless of the facts, and you leave it up to them to decide when it's unfair, now, I understand many of you will say, well, then realistically, isn't this just returning to the status quo? Kind of, which would be bad enough. But now the status quo has the like the official approval of the Biden administration. If a school, which already bans trans athlete participation, does so under this, they are only doing what they have been told they can and should do by the Democratic president. Am I crazy, Brett? Or is this maybe the Honestly, I am so sick of Biden taking like two weeks off for like extended naps and not even appearing in the national news. But if this is the alternative, go back to sleep. My official response to this debate is that the Republicans are trying to cut Social Security and Medicare. I understand that. Yes. The reason that this that. is, listen, <laughs> the reason this that. is, this is like a hydraulic pump, a hydraulic lift. It is a way for political operatives to make a big giant move of something that otherwise seems very heavy by putting like the right amount of pressure on a very tiny thing. They're doing something that really only affects like 1% of the population to make everybody mad. Why? Yeah. Like and and it comes down to sports are ridiculous. I love them. They are insane. Sports are us like saying we want to find out who's the best at like throwing something. It's ridiculous. And we don't want to the way it's set up now, we don't want to find out who's the best at throwing something. We want to find out the best of what one kind of person frequently mm -hmm. is the best at throwing something. And now we're just and and sometimes it's like a you know, it's all kinds of stuff about your biology. How old is your biology? How much does your biology weigh? We start sectioning things off. It is ridiculous. It is always discriminatory. You're discriminating against heavy wrestlers by putting them in a different division. What the fact is, is we have I want to draw a line between what is a fun social activity that should then use social indicators of your gender and what is like a scientific breakdown of what makes people a certain way so that I can scientifically prove who's the best at throwing something. But here's it all breaks down. It is just like it is just like anything. But the reason that people want to talk about the reason that this is another reason this is popular because everybody just really wants to talk about it because no one really knows what to do. And the reason you don't really know what to do is because it's a ridiculous. The sports are silly. And then compound that with. Listen, we, I, I look at, I, everyone's been to like an elementary school soccer game who knows about soccer. Oh, there's positions here. No, it's a clump of people kicking each other in the shins. And so that's a social activity. People just wanna know how to be on teams. We should, in uh, my opinion, we should apply the social gender definitions to that. Go ahead and do it. I think it all should be co-ed at a certain point anyway, because it's about team building and working together. But if you yeah. talk to any parent around that field, it is the Olympics. And because of that dynamic, talking too much about it is just giving in to hateful schmucks. I agree there, there are a lot of hateful schmucks in this conversation. It's so fun, yeah. isn't it, John? Yeah. I get to say um, like whose side I'm on. When really, and then the place that it most 
tangibly breaks down is okay, let's talk about it. Like, all right, so I wanna have, I wanna see who's the best female swimmer, which is what everybody's talking about. You're being even more ridiculous when you need to look at people's genitals. Be like, I wanna really be, you know, and they're voting to let doctors look at kids' genitals to see if they should be in the pool. So that many times. But then people are like, but I, but my daughter who has a VJJ is, uh, trust me, I don't want you to look at their genitals. Okay, fine. My daughter needs, I need her to be in the pool without people with WeWars because I think this is her path to getting a scholarship, to getting monetary rewards for education. That's not, I don't know why we give like sports scholarships <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. And you can give me the finger, but that's what everybody that's what everybody wants to talk I, about. And no, no one's I, well, acknowledging how do, ridiculous the entire conversation is on yeah, all sides. Is, and no one understands sports. Some people selectively only understand social dynamics. But pretending this is just like a one easy thing, it just denies yeah. so much of reality. I get that. It, look, I do think that one of the reasons some people weigh in is that there are a lot of interesting components of that. I don't doubt any of that, and you have raised many of them. Uh, the Most issue is people. that while many people do want to talk about that, I have another block that I also want to talk about with the limited amount of minutes that we have remaining this hour. So uh, I like most of what you said. I don't like Biden's position, especially because he'd indicated during the presidency that he would not provide this sort of like, um, you know, official like approval of this sort of process. It, I, I think that a lot of trans people are going to see this as a massive betrayal. Um, but anyway, Brett, you're the best. You know who's not the best? We're going to turn to him now, actually. Just days after the judge in Donald Trump's hush money case warned him about the sort of rhetoric that he is known to make when he's under pressure that can lead to you know, people doing and saying crazy things can lead to death, mess, death threats and those sorts of things. Trump has perhaps not reached the lows that he has at other points of this process, but his rhetoric is going to some weird places, including him bleeding. As much as I can enjoy a day like Tuesday where the radical left lunatics, maniacs and perverts had me indicted and arrested for blah, blah, blah. So I just wanna read that part to remind you that he is now referring to, I don't know, is it was it the cop that let the door hit you in the face? Was it Alvin Bragg? Was it Judge Martian? Which one is the pervert in this particular case? Um, but anyway, uh, there's a lot of uh, incendiary rhetoric out there, and it looks like it's having an effect. Um, they uh, apparently have now received, we could jump ahead to graphic three. There have been dozens of threats directed just individually at the judge already. This was a couple of days ago that he was brought in. They've received dozens of threats. His family has also received threats, and I will remind you that Donald Trump, was talking about the family, the wife and the daughter at his speech at Mar-a-Lago. Don Jr. posted a photo, Breitbart of course was spreading information about the family. It was to produce these threats and oh, what do you know, the threats have come. Now, uh, also a reminder by the way of how, uh, how dangerous these can get. Last month, Alvin Bragg, who is receiving new death threats, received a letter containing a death threat and white powder with the very nuanced and reasonable message of Alvin, I am going to kill you. It doesn't seem like the white powder was actually, I guess I'm gonna say it was supposed to be anthrax, but there is a lot of Republican attention on this topic. A lot of demonization of Alvin Bragg and the judge and his family already going on. So, so far it's just been threats, but is there someone somewhere trying to plan something? Uh, I hope that the security in the area are not just expecting this is all gonna be fine. Right, what do you think? I think it's not nice to threaten the death of a, a judge. I think that's weird. And I think it's hilarious that uh, you know, the people on the right will pick someone, what will, you know, single out one person and say that they're perverts for whatever reason. Yeah. And then completely ignore the fact that there are death threats being levied against all kinds of people, not just the not just Alvin Bragg, but like the right is literally issued death threats against the Bud Light Clydesdales. The the horses? Yeah. Don't let Kid Rock get within a country mile of those horses. Anyway, we're gonna keep you apprised of what's going on on this story. That is unfortunately all the time we have for the first hour of our show, though. Thank you everyone who's been listening and watching. There's more to come in the aftermath, including the throwing away of the garbage people of the week. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.